Okay, welcome all uh, to the fourth day of the conference and we are happy to have uh, Joe Lammers from University of Melbourne. He's going to speak about McDonald polynomials and long range spin chains. Please, uh, Joe. All right, thank you very much. And I would like to thank the organizers for uh, inviting me to this interesting conference and uh, uh, allowing me to contribute to it by presenting yet another point of view or application of McDonald's polynomials. So indeed, I want to talk about McDonald's polynomials and their relations to spin chains, or more precisely, long range spin chains. And this is physically motivated. So I'll start with this physical motivation, but I want to uh, alternatively present this as a kind of a variation or a spin on McDonald theory. So really it's a kind of, you can view this as a special case of a, or a limit of spin McDonald theory. And I'll explain this later. Um, also, this is work um, that I've been doing in the last few years. In particular, it's based on a long paper with Vincent Pasquier and Didina Serban. And um, in the last months, I've been revisiting this problem. So I hope that even some people who may have seen me present this before will get something new uh, because I have a new take on this story that I think is interesting. So let's start with a bit of physical background, just in case you have never seen this notion of spin chains. And this is the, really the only physics slide in the talk, so don't worry. Now, spin chains are really originate as quantum mechanical models for magnetic material. So if you have a magnet like on the right, then if you zoom in a lot, it consists of a three-dimensional array of atoms. And according to quantum mechanics, these atoms have a quantity called spin. And you can think of this in a particular case as a little arrow pointing up and down. And somehow these arrows, they talk to each other. So they might all want to point in the same direction or they might want to alternate and so on. And at the big scale, this gives rise to magnetism. And spin chains are special models in that they are one dimensional. This is actually realistic. So certain materials in nature behave in this way. And also in the laboratory, people can make one dimensional settings. So now we just have a line of atoms with spins. And often I want to think of these, rather than a line, I want to think of this in a finite setting as uh, a ring uh, of these atoms that talk to each other like I've drawn here. And long range interactions are when these atoms can talk to each other or the spins of these atoms can talk to each other across longer ranges. So traditionally, these models are studied under the assumption that only neighbors can talk with each other. But of course, actually in nature, this is not always true. And there are some interactions at longer distances as well. And these type of models also have applications in various fields of physics. Now, a little bit more mathematically, though not quite precise, um, let me give some sort of definition. So a spin chain is a sequence as follows. So we start with a finite dimensional complex vector space that I will call V, and we consider its n-fold tensor products. So in this picture, V is just two-dimensional. It's a span of the vector that I've called up. So in physics, we call it spin up, and a vector, another basis vector that is called spin down. So this is really um, depicts an element of the tensor basis element for this tensor product where the spins are up and down and so on. And so this is a basis element in this big vector space. And on this big vector space, we have a distinguished operator called the Hamiltonian. And this really tells us how these spins interact with each other. So whether they might want to point in the same direction or opposite directions or maybe something else. And if they can only talk to each other if they're next to each other or across longer distances. Now, physically, you might want this Hamiltonian to be self-adjoint so that their eigenvalues, the energies, are real. Um, we certainly want this expression to be uniform in n, meaning that I can't just write down a different, completely different formula as I increase n. So I want kind of a nice and uniform formula in n for this Hamiltonian. And then physically, you would want the limit n going to infinity, at least morally, to make sense. So maybe not quite rigorously mathematically, but at least we want to be able to say something about this at the level of physics. And the idea is that n going to infinity means kind of zooming back out into this picture to the level of the magnet, which of course is not quite has infinitely many particles, but at least it has many, many particles. So we think of this as n going to infinity. And so really this is indexed by this n, the number of, I will often call these sites. So each dot is a site. And the goal is to understand the spectrum of this Hamiltonian and maybe some other quantities associated with it. First for fixed but arbitrary, n, and then you want to understand at least the low-lying part of the spectrum as n goes to infinity. So that's kind of the name of the game in physics. Now, a priori, there's absolutely no uh, reason to expect this to be related to McDonald's polynomials. Actually, in general, if you write down some Hamiltonian, which may be physically motivated, you can't even expect to really understand this spectrum 
in great detail. You might have to put this in the computer and approximate or uh, do all sorts of things. But in some cases, you're lucky. And this Hamiltonian spectrum can actually be understood exactly. And um, in even more rare cases, this is really because there is an underlying mathematical structure. So we can use representation theory to understand this spectrum. What I want to focus on today are two spin chains, or actually one spin chain, um, that um, allows, has such an accept, admits such an accept, uh, exact description of the spectrum, and in fact features McDonald's polynomials in the spectrum. So here is the kind of the background. So this is not quite the model that I want to talk about, but this is the one that came first. So here's an example of such a Hamiltonian. It's called the Haldane-Shastri Hamiltonian. So here I want to think of V as being C to the R. So this is the case R is two with just two basis vectors, but there might be more. Now I've considered the n-fold tensor product of V to the, uh, of C to the R, and I have the following operator on it. I have a sum over pairs of these sides, so I and J as shown here. And basically between these pairs, I have a one minus the permutation of the, what I will call spin in general at site I and at site J. So I'm going to exchange whichever basis vector or whichever vector I have here and here. So this is like some sort of anti-symmetrization, but there's a prefactor here, the potential, which kind of dampens this. So I will often write it in terms of these Zs. So it's minus Zi, Zj over the difference Zi minus Zj squared, where Zj you know, it's omega to the j with omega, the primitive nth root of unity. So the picture here is I think of this uh, circle as sitting in the complex plane. It's actually the unit circle and omega j is just the jth root of unity. And then I can write this uh, potential like this. Um, in terms of real coordinates, this is just one over four sine squared of pi over n times the difference here. So really this is nothing but one over the course distance squared between these two sides. So what this potential does is, is it makes sure that as these atoms are further and further apart, the interactions between them are weaker and weaker. Very good. So this is an example of such a spin chain Hamiltonian. It was uh, discovered independently by Haldane and Shastri in 1988 for different reasons. And it has a lot of remarkable properties. I want to outline the following. Um, oh, actually, before I do this, it's useful to um, kind of rewrite this anti-symmetrization a little bit. So rather than having one minus pij, let's take a reduced decomposition of this long distance permutation as indicated in this picture. So I want to think of this pij really as being move j first to i plus one by consecutive uh, simple transpositions, then anti-symmetrize. So here the zigzag picture is the anti-symmetrization but just for i and i plus one, and then move j back. Right? So this is really just a de reduced decomposition of this anti-symmetrization. And the permutations are just an SN action on this n-fold tensor product. And as I said, this zigzaggy line is the anti-symmetrizer. All right, so this Hamiltonian has the following properties. Firstly, it has some interesting physical motivation. So you can understand this as a toy model for something called the fractional quantum Hall effect. Now, I don't want to go into this, but this model, so its spectrum exhibits things like fractional statistics. So it shows anions and other phenomena which show up in this setting in physics. So it's a kind of a nice toy model because it's just for fixed and a finite dimensional problem. Moreover, this Hamiltonian is part of a family of commuting operators. So I want to call these commuting operators the abelian symmetries. And these commuting operators, moreover, have non-abelian symmetries. So they all commute with a particular action of the Youngian of GLR on this n-fold tensor product of V. So there's a particular representation of the Youngian. It's slightly different from the one that you might be used to. And it commutes precisely with this Hamiltonian and all of the other higher Hamiltonians in this family of abelian symmetries. And the most relevant perhaps for us here today is that it's exact, it allows us to describe the spectrum exactly and they feature Jack polynomials. So let me focus on the case R is two. So V is just C2. Then the Youngian GL2 highest weight eigenvectors in this n-fold tensor product are determined by, well, a very nice formula. So here I focus on the component of this vector where I put all the down spins, so the second basis vector to the left and then all the up spins to the right. And if I have M of these down spins, then this component has the following form. Here there's just the square of the van der Monde in M variables, these Zs are these roots of unity. 
And then I have a particular case of a Jack polynomial, namely where the parameter alpha is a half. So this is really a spherical zonal polynomial in M variables. And it's indexed by this partition lambda, which is an M, a length M partition with this condition that the first part is bounded by N, the length of the chain, minus 2M, the number of these down spins, plus 1. OK, so this is really remarkable. Um, if you do the combinatorics, then you, well, we also know the Drinfeld polynomials for this thing, so you understand the dimension of this Youngian um, module. And uh, you can check that really the full spectrum can be described in this way. So everything is either a Youngian highest weight vector of this form, or it can be obtained, of course, by the action of the Youngian from such a highest weight vector. So and a question. Yes, please. So I um, uh, just want to clarify the Hamiltonian. So what is 1 minus pij? So in terms of the spins, so is it sigma i minus sigma j? Ah, right, very good. So if you have r is equal to 2, yes. then this 1 minus pij is nothing but 1 minus sigma dot sigma. So 1 minus sigma x, sigma x, sigma ah. y, sigma y, sigma z, ah. sigma z, over 2. So okay. in, right, exactly. And so it, for r is 2, it's, re it's really the well-known, we call it, it's called the exchange interaction. But Actually, this is kind of a, a bit more representation theoretic way to rewrite it, and this clearly generalizes to higher rank without any problem. So, it's so I'm, I'm having a bit of trouble correlating that with uh, this uh, this braid operation. So uh, it's not uh, exchanging sigma i and sigma j. That pij is it is it the transposition p uh, sigma i j? I mean, the right. I mean, sigma i j is just another way to write this one. I mean, the, the, the 1 minus sigma dot sigma is another way of writing this operator. We view this as an operator on this big tensor product. Uh -huh. So what it does is, it, indeed, it anti-symmetrizes the vectors at i and j. Okay. And it does so whether you write it in terms of the sigmas, the Pauli matrices, or if you do it in terms of the permutation. OK, thank you. Okay. Thanks for asking. And please do interrupt me and ask questions. Um, very good. So here is a very special Hamiltonian, which has lots of nice properties, and in particular, its spectrum, so here I haven't really told you, but basically all the other components are of a similar form where you just replace the location of these down spins. That's the Zs that show up. So it's not so important. So really this component is a component that completely determines the vector. And I will explain where the, what this comes from later on. Right, so now of course we are not in a conference on poly, uh, applications of Jack polynomials, but we were like McDonald's polynomials. So let's go to the next level. So really the main result is that there exists what I want to call a T-deformed haldane shastri operator. Namely, there exists some operator on this same space, which is physically motivated in the sense that it deforms this haldane shastri Hamiltonian. So it will depend on the extra parameter. And if you send this extra parameter T to one, you get back the, the, the operator from the previous slide. Moreover, it still belongs to a family of commuting operators. And this family commutes with an action, not of the Youngian, but now of the quantum loop algebra. So this is the quantum loop algebra of GLR, or if you want Jimbo Mio annotation, so this is the quantum affine algebra without the derivation at level zero, right? It's a finite dimensional representation. And this operator, so this is the deformation of the Halling Shastri model that is singled out by having these extra properties of still having this abelian and non-abelian symmetries. Now this operator we can write down very explicitly. So here it is. I've taken basically the picture that I had before, but now I reinterpret. So I've added some parameters on these lines, which are just like before, the jth roots of unity. And I've re now I want to reinterpret each of these little crossings here as an R check matrix. So this is the R check matrix of this quantum loop algebra here, acting on this tensor product. And this zigzaggy line, the anti symmetrization is now replaced by basically a multiple of the derivative of this R check matrix. Um, this is nothing but the T anti-symmetrizer, as I will make more explicit later on. So we have this deformation of the long-range permutations, but now involving parameters and R matrices. And then here is this uh, potential is also deformed by the appearance of an extra T and T inverse here. So basically, if you think before we had a 1 over van der Monde squared in the denominator, now we have a T van der Monde and a T inverse van der Monde factor sitting there. So this is really kind of a very natural uh, formula if you, I mean, we didn't write down this formula and then check that it obeyed all these properties. We really derived it by demanding these other properties to be true. And moreover, as a bonus, what we get is that 
there is again an exact description of the spectrum now with McDonald's polynomials. So if we take RS2, so just the case with the two-dimensional vector space, then the spectrum again can be completely described in terms of quantum loop highest weight eigenvectors. Um, now determined with exactly the same components by rather than just a square of the van der Monde, we have this sort of T-deformed but symmetric square of the van der Monde vector. And then where we had Jack, we now have the corresponding case of McDonald polynomials. So this is really rather nice. We have this quantum zonal, uh, quantum spherical zonal special case of McDonald polynomials showing up to describe basically what in physics we would call um, more or less the wave function or at least one component here. And for the experts, we can also explicitly write down the Drenfeld polynomial. So here it is, I can comment on it later. I'm sorry, may I ask a question? Please. Uh, what is Q here? So Q is, um, right, so this is McDonald's uh, QT, right? So this is kind of the special value of Q and this is kind of the special oh, oh. value of, of T, so to say. So it is, yeah, right. So it's the case where um, Q is T to the one half, which is this quantum spherical zonal special case. But it's completely determined into, in terms of this deformation parameter T. So it's completely fixed. I can, unfortunately, I cannot vary, vary this parameter Q here. Okay, may I ask one more question? So is, is there a similar formula for general R? Um, let me comment on that later. I think it will make sense to get back to that at the end when I've explained. So basically, the, what I want to do in this talk is explain where all of this comes from. And I think after that, we'll be much more in a position to discuss these type of things. But please do remind me if I forget. Thank you. No uh, excuse me. I have another yes, question. Um, mm -hmm. Your expression of this, um, well, the, the, in, the, in the Hamiltonian, uh, now the zigzag before, you could have put it in any position between i and j. Right. And now is it the same? Is it irrelevant? No, it's the really, it is, it's, it's precisely sitting there. So before, ah, okay. yeah, there were many ways of decomposing this reduced, or to, to do it. Now it's sitting here. Actually, uh, as will at least implicitly become clear later on, there's another. So in this, uh, one of the other Hamiltonians in this family here is very easy to describe. It corresponds to the left-right flipped version of this picture. So I could also have the interaction taking place all the way to the right. So I could also transport I all the way to J minus one, then interact and then move it back. That's another one of these higher Hamiltonians. Um, okay, but it can't just be in the middle. And I will derive this formula later on. So we will understand where it comes from. Thanks for the question. Uh, but it's true, this is a big difference with the level that I had before. So before, of course, I could have chosen many reduced decompositions and here somehow two are singled out and I will focus on the one where it's on the left. Um, all right, so now the main point is that actually what I've been talking about is really a spin version of McDonald's theory in disguise. So this same operator that I wrote down before really is a, what I will call a frozen version of what I will call a spin McDonald's operator. So I will explain in detail what I mean by freezing and what I mean by spin McDonald theory. So let me start by the physical picture. So a spin chain, as I had before, is this um, circle with atoms sitting equally spaced and the spins of them, so the spins of these atoms talk to each other. Now, really, there is a more general theory, namely the spin McDonald's Reusner's uh, theory, which is describes the same number of particles, but now not just with the spin, but also with the coordinates. So they can move around on this circle. And so it's a quantum anybody system. It is actually integrable. And if you take this particular limit that I want to call freezing, which physically corresponds to um, taking a limit in which the kinetic energy is suppressed with respect to the potential energy, so as a consequence, the particles are going to sit at their classical equilibria positions, which are precisely equally spaced. So that's the picture. And then we get this spin chain. And since this already had many of these remarkable properties, the spin chain, because we do this freezing very carefully, inherits all those properties. So that's really the punchline of the talk. And let me, so in most of the talk, I will just reiterate this from the start to really explain where this comes from. But let me outline how it's going to work. So in short, we can think of this big space, this v nth tensor power of V, as some sort of fancy uh, rewritten space. So I'll come back to this in detail later on. But there is a point of view of this space on the left, um, which naturally comes with an action of the center of the affine Hecke algebra, which is given, as we know, by symmetric polynomials in the Ys. 
And these include, so the Ys here are the geratinic operators. They basically act on these polynomials here. Um, so we think of this factor here as a representation of the affine Hecke algebra. Then we take a tensor product over the finite Hecke algebra. This is no longer a representation of the affine Hecke algebra, but it is still of its center. So the center acts by, for instance, elementary symmetric polynomials on the left factor. So we only act on this factor and we are just the identity on this other factor. And this here is what I want to call these spin McDonald's operators. And I can describe them very explicitly. I will tell this uh, later on. Now, of course, since these operators lie in the center, they all commute with each other. So of course they are abelian symmetries. And moreover, there is an action of the quantum loop algebra, which as I will explain, comes from quantum affine sure while duality. So that's really a natural point of view that I will start with. And this will of course commute with this center here. So everything has the properties that I want. And moreover, this Hamiltonian at the top here arises as a special case. So we take some linear combination of these spin McDonald's operators. We take a, we linearize at Q is one where Q is the parameter of the Tredenic Y operators uh, coming from the affine Hecke algebra representation here. So we do this linearization and then up to some constants. And then we do this modulo the ideal of polynomials generated by the power sums. So we take the first n power sums and then the last power sum minus n. And really where this comes from is if you think about these roots of unity here, they're all distinct and precisely these are the powers, th these are the quantities that vanish at those roots of unity. So this is a much cleaner algebraic way of saying that all these variables should be different roots of unity. We just kill all the power sums except the last one, which has to be equal to n. So, and we do this very nicely. It will inherit all these nice properties. And really that's the structure under giving rise to these results that I've uh, presented before. So this is what I want to uh, do from now on. Are there any questions at this point? I mean, I will clarify everything. So I guess this is really the worst point to ask for questions. But, um, all right, so let me go on. So here's some algebraic background. So let's start with the finite Hecke algebra of type A. So we have these uh, generators T, they obey the braid relations and this quadratic condition. And there are two important representations, one that we all uh, know and love, either on Laurent polynomials or on polynomials in N variables, where these T's are represented by these demasuralistic operators. So we've of course uh, seen these come around several times. For now, however, let me focus on this other, uh, so I want to call this the polynomial representation, but there's also a spin representation. So take V is C to the R and consider its n-fold tensor product. Then there's a representation of the Hecke algebra where Ti acts non-trivially in the ith and ith plus first factor as the identity elsewhere. And this is a very explicitly given matrix. So for instance, if V is just two-dimensional, then this is what T uh, looks like depending on your convention. So this is just a very explicit uh, representation of the Hecke algebra. You can write it down for a higher rank as well. Um, it's also closely related. Well, that's the next point. So Jimbo realized that really this is very closely related to, to an action of a quantum group. So on this same space, there's also a representation of what I will denote by curly U R, which is U T one half G L R. So just not affine, but just the normal quantum group of G L R. And now I view V as the standard representation and by the co-product, it gets a representation on this n-fold tensor product. And this representation commutes with the one of the Hecke algebra. In fact, if you're more precise, these two actions generate each other's commutant in the operator algebra of operators on this big space. And as a consequence, this big space decomposes very nicely. So this is a statement of quantum sure while duality. Namely, this big tensor product decomposes as a direct sum indexed by partitions of n of length at most r, where each sum n is a tensor product of two factors. The factor on the left, v superscript lambda, is the quantum SPECT module. So it's a finite dimensional Hecke uh, irreducible. And the factor on the right is the highest weight space for uh, so a finite dimensional UR representation. Okay, so this is a very beautiful result. It says that if you focus on the Hecke algebra action, then you get these quantum SPECT modules. They occur several times, namely the dimension of this highest weight representation many times. Or if I want to focus on the quantum group, I have this highest weight representation occurring multiple times, namely this 
dimension of this quantum spect module many times. So let me just give an example to make it very, very concrete. So if I take n is 5 and r is 2, so v is just this two-dimensional space, then here are all the partitions of 5. Um, I've organized, so in this picture, each dot represents a basis vector of the big space. So these are all one-dimensional subspaces, basically. And here I've organized them in the uh, vertical direction by the weight or the number of these downspins, the number of the second basis vector. So in each of these cases, I have this quantum spect module. They are always in the horizontal direction and the highest weight representation in the vertical direction. So here's an example for the partition five. I have this six-dimensional uh, UP uh, UT one half GL two representation. It looks like a kind of this string as we know, and in the horizontal direction there's nothing. So this is the trivial representation for the Heck algebra. The next vector corresponding to the partition four comma one corresponds to these length four strings. So they're the four dimensional representation of UQ uh, or UT one half GL two, and in the horizontal direction there's also a four dimensional representation, which is the standard representation of the Heck algebra. Then. The next sum end corresponding to the partition 3, 1. Well, in the Hecke direction, it happens to look like some sort of little kite. Uh, these basis vectors are um, uh, indexed by a um, standard Young tableau of this shape. So you can easily check that this is true. And in the vertical direction, they're two dimensional. So just the standard representation of UT 1 half GL2. And then there are actually three more partitions, but they're absent be essentially because you can't anti symmetrize any more often because V was two-dimensional to start with. OK, so this is really what this uh, right-hand side looks like for a particular example. Sorry, now there is a, a minor quibble. <laughs> you yes, missed please. a 3 one, one. <laughs> So there are actually four that are absent. <laughs> oh, you're right. Yes, yeah, you're completely right. Thanks for correcting. Course, minor. Yes, you're right. OK, I'll correct it later on. Um, Luckily, it was absent. So uh, I did a dimension counting. I didn't, I didn't detect it by that way. <laughs> All right, great. So there is a slightly more fancy point of view, which is called the quantum Schur functor. So rather than thinking of this schur wild duality as this explicit decomposition on the left, I can also think of it as a map which sends finite dimensional Hecke algebra modules to finite dimensional quantum group modules, where R is this dimension of this space V. Namely, um, basically, what I'm going to do is I'm in the sum ends, if you give me one of the things on the left, I will give you one of the things on the right. That's basically what the map does. So more abstractly, it sends a Hecke algebra module to this module tensor product over the Hecke algebra with this big space that we've been studying so far. And in particular, what this tensor product over the Hecke algebra does is, well, it precisely does what I said before. It sends these SPECT modules to these highest weight modules provided lambda doesn't have length too much, because then I would start to anti-symmetrize too much, and that's not good. Um, OK, so this is just a different way of looking at the same picture. So in, in terms of this picture here, if you give me one of these red components, I will send it to one of the blue components that is sort of attached to it, right? That's, that's what this uh, quantum Schur factor does. Very good. Now, this was all finite hack algebra. Now let's go to the affine level. So, at the affine level, we're studying the affine Hecke algebra of type GLN. So this consists of the finite Hecke algebra tensored with Laurent polynomials in Ys. And these two tensor factors, they're related by what I want to call cross relations, which I want to highlight. I use the, the convention in which uh, Yi, if you multiply from both sides by Ti, is moves to Yi plus one. Um, these are precisely the relations that are obeyed by if Y was multiplication by X. OK, so I choose this form of the relations, which is symmetric in that sense. And then if ti and yj, they commute if i and j are sort of uh, far enough apart. Again, there is a version of the Schur functor, now a quantum affine Schur functor. And now it does like what we did before, but now with heads on top. So it sends finite dimensional affine Hecke algebra modules to finite dimensional quantum loop algebra modules. And the way it does it, so here this is this quantum loop algebra, u r hat now denotes this ut one half loop GLR. So what it does is, as a vector space, it does exactly the same like we did before. So we send m to this tensor product over the Hecke algebra with the space that we were studying before. But this came with a ur action, and this will be is explicitly upgraded to some action of this quantum loop algebra. I will use the RLL presentation, so this um, Padev 
Stichen Tachtajan presentation later on. I won't explain this in detail because I kind of think that you either know it or you don't. And if you don't, then I'm not going to be able to explain it in the time that I have. But if you do know it, I want to actually at least tell you the idea. So I will do this in a moment. But moreover, there's something more. So before, this was just a finite dimensional UR module. In this case, actually, this space carries a little bit more extra structure. So we don't just get this quantized loop algebra action, but the center of the affine Hecke algebra still acts on this. This is really a difference with, difference with the previous non-affine level. So of course, the center of the affine Hecke algebra, which are uh, symmetric polynomials in Ys or Y inverses, they commute with all the TI generators. And so they really act on this tensor product over the Hecke algebra. And these two actions commute. This is not completely clear, but it is clear if you see the explicit action of the UR. And I will give some examples in a moment. So this is really some extra structure that we get in the affine level. We have an explicit action of the quantum loop algebra and an action of the center, and these two commute with each other. So this hopefully starts sounding a little bit like the results that I've been advertising. So let's look at some examples. And let's first look at two kind of extreme examples. So the first one is the, exam the following uh, representation of the affine Hecke algebra, uh, namely standard modules. So let's fix an n-tuple uh, of non-zero complex numbers, which I'll call z, and consider the one-dimensional module for just the subalgebra of Laurent polynomials in the y's, given by one vector v of z, on which each yi acts by this eigenvalue zi. So that's where these z's that I picked go. Now, what we do is we induce this one-dimensional module up to the affine Hecke algebra. So basically what you do is you act by all the Hecke generators, the finite Hecke generators on it. This will give a n factorial dimensional space. And then the y's on those things, well, their values are completely determined by these relations and the z's being eigenvalues of the y's. So this is what it looks like. It's always n factorial dimensional and it's irreducible when these parameter z, these eigenvalues are generic. So I don't want two different z's to differ by a factor of t. Now in this case, what this functor associates this representation to is the following. So we take this uh, module, the standard module, and we take the tensor product over the Hecke algebra with this spin space. And it's easy to see that really this is the same as a tensor product of evaluation model, modules. So I'm going to reinterpret these parameters z here basically as the evaluation parameters, and I have n different evaluation parameters on the right. And if you know what a tensor, a tensor product of evaluation modules is, then you know what the quantum loop algebra action will be. So here, is, here it is in terms of an L operator. So I actually will write down what these R matrices are, but they're the, the R, well, they're the R matrices that you know from uh, this quantum loop algebra. So you take this product of R matrices, and here we have these extra evaluation parameters appearing in the denominator. And this L operator is interesting. If you take its trace, then you get the transfer matrix of what you can either interpret as the inhomogeneous Heisenberg XXZ spin chain, which is actually another really long range integrable spin chain. It's long range because it's inhomogeneous. And also it's closely related to integrable vertex models that we heard, for instance, Michael talk about yesterday. So this quantum loop algebra here is very interesting. Unfortunately, the center of the affine Hecke algebra just acts by scalars, symmetric functions in these constants z. So that's not very nice. So this is a bit boring. Now, the other extreme is the following representation, which we all love. It's on, let's say, polynomials in x's, where the t's act by these demasuralistic operators and the y's act by the theoretic difference operators. Right? So here I wrote it in terms of the finite Hecke generators and this row, which is the cyclic twist that depends on a parameter q. This is an infinite dimensional affine Hecke algebra module, but it is reducible and its irreducible pieces are indexed by partitions and are finite dimensional. So take any partition of length at most n, consider the orbit under the symmetric group. So you get a lot of composition, all the compositions of this partition. For each of them, we have a non-symmetric McDonald polynomial, which is a joint eigenfunction of the y's. And Basically, the Hecke generators move you between the different parts of this orbit, essentially. Well, I mean, the Hecke generators don't quite, but you can write down something that does precisely do that. So this is what the um, irreducible affine Hecke algebra submodules look like. These are finite dimensional pieces, so we can put them in the quantum affine Schur functor and see what we get. So let's first 
look at the kind of boring case, but actually it's nice too, where R is one. So this vector space in this case is one dimensional. I just have C and fold tensor products. And I want to reinterpret this as a trivial uh, SPECT module. So it's a trivial module for the finite Hecke algebra. Then what this tensor products over the finite Hecke algebra does is it just projects onto symmetric polynomials. In this case, the L operator is boring. It's just one or maybe another constant depending on your normalization for the R matrix. So this quantum loop algebra action is not very nice in this case, but of course the center here acts, it's, it's very nice. We all love this. This is acts by uh, McDonald uh, operators, right? So this is very interesting and this is really the topic of the conference. And in particular, if you explicitly apply this functor to these submodules here, it's precisely sense by essentially T symmetrization to just the one dimensional space with the McDonald polynomial for that partition. So here we see McDonald theory kind of arises a special, uh, very degenerate, if you wish, case of, of this general picture here. And here we, well, we all know the McDonald operator is the sum over these rational coefficients times these Q shift operators in the different variables. The physical picture, which was advocated by Hausner, is really in uh, 87, so the same time as McDonald, is that these are these particles moving on a circle. They don't have any spin, but they're particles moving on a circle. They have commuting operators, so it's an integrable model. And McDonald's taught us what the eigenfunctions are. And Cherednik realized that you can really get this from the symmetric theory, uh, from the non-symmetric theory. Very good. So now we have these two extreme examples of sorry. the quantum affine Schurz functor. Yes, please. Yeah, sorry to interrupt you, but uh, I don't see where the move, where do you see that the particles are moving in this picture? I mean, um, so basically think of this Q difference operator. So I think of these X's, they're the coordinates, but they're multiplicative coordinates. So I think of these as E to the um, okay. Y, J, or I don't know, E to the Xi, J. Then mm -hmm. you see that this multiplying by Q really shifts the particles by, well, if Q is E to the, I don't know, uh, eta or something like that, then the particles are moved by eta. So this is somehow what the kinetic energy, the kinetic term, it kind of moves things. Okay, but it's still then a discrete movement. It's not a continuous movement. It is a difference model, yes. But Reissenaars really obtained this by thinking he wanted, so if you know these calogero sutherland type models where you just have a differential operator. Yeah. So Reissenaars wanted to, was interested in finding a sort of a relativistic version of uh, these calogero sutherland models. And he came basically to exactly these McDonald's operators from his point of view. Um, so, so you, you kind of think of Q as parameterizing some sort of speed of light. And if you take the Jack limit, then you send the speed of light to infinity and you get back the classical or non-relativistic calogero sutherland model. But uh, do you need a constraint that uh, Q should be this uh, same root of unity as, uh, as the Z? No. So in other words, should it be commensurate with the size of the circle? No, you don't have to do this, no. It's just like in the Jack case, this parameter alpha can be anything. Um, uh, of course, whether the spectrum looks particularly nice depends on what the parameter alpha is, but. Um, okay, um, so if, if Q is not commensurate, then then you can really occupy any site on the. Oh yeah, sorry, these these particles are there. I try to not have them regularly spaced. So they are moving freely along the circle. They're continuously moving along the circle. Okay, so they are. It, it just happens to here to involve different operators, but we really think of particles as moving con continuously along the circle. So, oh, oh. Right. okay, maybe I'll ask you that. Okay, yeah. Okay. I'm a bit confused. Okay. All right, thanks. Very good. So now we have had these two extreme examples. In one case, the L operator, or so this quantum loop algebra, had an interesting action. In the other case, the center had an interesting action. So now, of course, let's look at kind of the sweet spot in the middle, so to say. So here is the result. We take R is at least two and apply this uh, quantum affine uh, Schur functor to the same affine Hecke algebra module where we have the Dreadnik difference operators and so on. And now we send it to this tensor products over the finite Hecke algebra with this spin space. So this space comes with non-abelian symmetries, namely an action of this quantum loop algebra action, uh, which for instance can be presented in terms of this L operator. So it's basically the usual L operator um, the one that we had before, before I had these Zs, which I called inhomogeneities maybe, they're the evaluation parameters. So what I've done, and this is really what you do when you apply this quantum affine Schur functor, is you replace these uh, evaluation parameters by Y operators 
in your view, those Y operators as acting on this factor on the left, and you view the R matrix as acting on the factor on the right. So to do all of this properly, it's a little bit of work. So this is just for kind of the experts who've seen L operators before. These R matrices are permutation times R check. Let me take all the permutations to the front. Here I have a zero subscript because I've introduced one extra copy of V. So I've introduced one extra what we call auxiliary space with an associated uh, formal parameter U. So now here I have this cyclic twist in this, well, of course here I have V, tensor product, among others, V to the tensor power N. So I have really N plus one copies of V. So this is just a cyclic twist in this N plus one fold tensor power. Here I have R check matrices. They act on this N plus one fold tensor power. Here's the explicit expression. It's the Baxterization formula, which we've heard mentioned before. Um, this of course has N plus one copies. So it's really a module for the finite hack algebra with N plus one strands. So I have a T zero as well. And this is what this R01, it will involve this T0 here. And then the Y operators and this formal parameter U, we can view as kind of acting in this first part. And maybe I have to, uh, um, so it's not maybe, yeah, right. So I think of this as, um, as a geometric series, for instance. So I can expand this thing here and um, um, I get a formal power series in U, um, but it will really act by something quite simple. And so that's what it is. So it is Bernard and, and company, they call this quantized inhomogeneity. So normally these, these Ys were just the parameter Z. So that's this picture here, these Zs, they're the inhomogeneities. And now if X replace these constants by Y operators. So in this sense I've sort of quantized them, I made them some non-trivial operators. Now I don't just have this quantum loop algebra action, but as I've mentioned before, we have these abelian symmetries. So we have the center of the fine heck algebra and they act by these spin McDonald's operators, which really just act by um, the elementary symmetric polynomials in the Y's or in my conventions, the Y inverses on the factor on the left. And you can write down very explicit expressions here, which Turetnik found, we found them independently. And then once I had the result, I realized that it was contained in this old paper of Turetnik somewhere in the back. Um, so here is, for instance, the first spin McDonald operator. Basically, it has the same structure as the non-spin McDonald operator. So it's a sum with the same rational coefficients. But now, rather than just having these Q shift operators, I have these pictures here. And again, each of these crossings, they mean R matrices. And then at the end, we have these, these are the, my graphical notation for the Q shift operators. So what I do is I take the jth particle, which has parameter xj associated to it. I move it all the way to the left, then I Q shift operator it, and then I move it all the way to the right. And the moving here is done with these R check matrices. So very explicitly, if I take n is equal to three, then this just has three terms. The first term is just like for the non-spin McDonald's operator. This is just a multiple of the identity with this, this uh, Q shift operator. Then the second term has the same rational coefficient, but particle two is moved to the left. Then we Q shift operator it, and then it's moved to the right again by our check matrices. And here particle three is moved first to, through two, then through one, then it's Q shifted, then it's moved back. So here you see the explicit expression in terms of our matrices. Right? So these pictures are just a very convenient way of encoding these formulas. So it's a, it's a quite natural deformation of this normal McDonald's operators. If you would forget about all the blue stuff, then you get precisely back the old McDonald's operators. Very good. So now we have this space. It comes with non-abelian symmetries and abelian symmetries. And moreover, it actually has an exact spectrum that you can describe in terms of McDonald's operators. So it has exact uh, highest weight eigenvectors for this quantum loop algebra action here. And this can be obtained by partially T symmetrizing the non-symmetric McDonald's polynomials. So to do this is a little bit of work. You have to think sometimes these non-symmetric McDonald's polynomials might give rise to the same vector, just like they did in the scalar theory when R was one, but sometimes they might not. It depends on how big your R is and in which weight space you are and so on. This was essentially studied by Takamura and Uglov uh, in, the, in the Jack limit. And they also obtained norms for these highest weight eigenvectors, which are very nicely expressed in terms of the norms of Jack polynomials. So I think that similar statements can be made here. Um, you can express the norms of these eigenvectors, I think, in terms of the norms of the McDonald's polynomials. So it's a really very nice 
uh, theory and you know the drain fault polynomial, so you really know a lot about this spin version of McDonald theory as well. All right, so now we have this kind of this model of these with these particles that can move around the circle. Now I want to get a spin chain. So here we go. This is the setting that I had before. I'm just repeating it. So we have this space with the non abelian and the abelian symmetries. And I want to explain to you how to get from this the spin chain. So, sorry, Jules, can I go back just uh, for a second to the last slide? Yes, of course. Where are you? So now this, this module has this auxiliary space and the spectral parameter u in right. it as it. And, um, so how come I don't, I'm not seeing any U at the moment in the, in the eigenvectors, is it secretly there? Well, in their eigenvalues it would be, but not in the vectors, yeah. right? This is- um, Ah, right, um, very good, okay, thank you. In thank this you case, yeah, good. notice that this is very different from the Heisenberg case. We do not do an algebraic beta ansatz. There are no spectral parameters in the spectrum. They're just eigenvectors, both for the, well, they're, eigen, they're eigenvectors for these, for these uh, spin McDonald's operators, and you can act with this to get kind of the descendants. Uh, but yeah, so they're they're a bit different. They do not in they do, yeah. indeed do not in involve spectral parameters. Great, thank you. Right. Very good. So the first step is as follows. Right. So basically, um, I want to get rid of these difference operators here because for a spin chain, I want to interpret everything as being acting on the factor on the right. And if you look at this formula, the thing that really does not act on this factor on the right, well, I don't really care about these constants so much. They just act by multiplication, that's okay. But these Q difference operators, they're really essentially act on the left. That's kind of really very different from a spin chain. So basically I want to get rid of these Q difference operators. And I will do this in two steps. So the first step is, well, we realize that these Q difference operators, if I expand them as a power series in Q around one, so they start off as the identity and then they involve a derivative and then you get higher order terms. So let's look at this expansion in Q. Physically, this would be, a, you can interpret this as a semi-classical expansion. So at zeroth order in Q, if I just set Q to be one, then the spin McDonald's operators, well, you delete these and then you realize, so basically you get rid of these little ticks in the picture and then you realize that the unitarity condition allows you to pull apart these just straighten out all lines. So all the spin parts drops out and the spin McDonald's operators reduce to the normal op McDonald's operators at Q is one, which are just constants. So this is not very interesting. So what we do is we go one order further in Q. So let me define Delta to be linearizing at Q is one or linearizing in Q. So then the linear part of this first spin McDonald's operator in Q has two parts. So we can, let's, we're going to look at this formula in the top. So we can move this t all the way through the right. What it will do is it will affect, it will q shift these denominators in the r matrices. So the r matrices depend on q and then the t sits to the right. So if I linearize this in q by the Leibniz rule, I get various different terms. If I just linearize the, this shift operator, then I get this derivative. All the R matrices are unaffected, the Q has disappeared, so they collapse like I described before, basically, and we get rid of the spin part. So this is just the multiple of the identity, really. I guess I should have drawn that here. But the other thing which I could have done is I could have linearized one of these R matrices, because their arguments depend on the Q. So if I use the chain rule and I regroup things a little bit, then the answer can be written in the following form. So you have the same sum over J with the same rational coefficients, and then an extra sum over I, excuse me, this should just go up to J minus one. Uh, so that's a typo. And then we have some prefactors, which you might recognize from before, and you have this picture. So basically the idea is that here, either we take a derivative of this R matrix or of this R matrix here. If I take a derivative of this R matrix, then this R matrix here became independent of Q. So again, I can straighten out these lines and this part disappears. This is why we get stuff with the identity here. Then I still have a derivative of this R matrix here. This is proportional to this T symmetrizer, but there is some argument. This is the derivative of the R matrix at one. Here I have a derivative of the R matrix at some slightly different thing. But anyway, it's a T symmetri uh, anti symmetrizer. So this is a projector. Here I have another R matrix. This R matrix times this projector is just a, multiplier, a multiple of this projector. And if I work out which multiple it is, this is the factor that drops out. So this answer is really quite pleasing. Moreover, 
it is not hard to see that if you now define the L operator to be the old L operator that I had at the top at Q is one. So recall for the McDonald's operators, if I set Q is one, they become trivial. The Y operator separately, they do not become trivial. And this L operator is not trivial at Q is one. So this is still an interesting thing that really depends on the polynomial kind of on the Y operator things. Moreover, because this McDonald's operator at Q is one is just a multiple of the identity, well, this thing, uh, sorry, the, this uh, spin McDonald's operator commutes with this L operator. So if I order by order expands that commutator in Q, then I easily see that the L operator at Q is one commutes with the linearized spin McDonald's operator. So we have some non-abelian symmetries. Moreover, all these spin McDonald's operators, they also still commute with each other. These linearized spin McDonald's operators commute with each other. And again, this really relies on the fact that the zeroth order was a constant. So at order Q squared, we have three terms, but the, if I take the second derivative in Q, then on the other side, I just get, get this constant and I get a commutator with a constant, which is zero. So this is the only non-trivial com commutator that's left. So we see that this procedure produces some kind of degeneration of this spin McDonald theory, which still has the abelian and the non-abelian symmetries. However, it still depends on these derivatives. So it's not quite a spin chain yet. So I have to do one extra thing. And here it goes. So now we have to remove the derivatives. And this goes as follows. Let's for a moment focus on the last spin McDonald operator. This is actually, if you think about it, well, this is independent of the spin part. So it's just the last McDonald operator, which is the total Q shift operator. We just Q shifts all the variables. Its linear part is the total derivative. So it's sum over all these partial derivatives here. So now we notice that the term that we want to remove is this part here, looks a bit similar to this part here, except that here I have these rational functions which are different for each term. So the question is, is there a special value for which all these prefactors, these rational functions become constants independent of J? And the answer is yes. Namely, if we take the Z to be consecutive root or actually just distinct roots of unity, then this will do the job. So at that point, all these coefficients here just become constants. I can take them out in front and then I can basically subtract a suitable multiple of this guy here from this guy here to completely get rid of the derivatives. And that's what we do. So to get the spin chain, we take this first spin McDonald operator, linearized, we subtract the linearized last spin McDonald operator and we put this at this particular roots of unity. Then we really get rid of all the derivatives and this is really the operator that I gave at the start. To be precise, it still acts on this big space here, but now there's just some multiplication, which is kind of fine. Actually, these are now constants because I've kind of evaluated all these x's to be z's. So I can really completely interpret this as an operator just on v to the nth tensor power. So that's where my spin chain Hamiltonian came from. Very good. So now let me get back to the main result. So we have this Hamiltonian, which I can, which I've just derived. It looks like this. And I've now motivated basically that rather than thinking of it as acting on the n fold tensor power of V, I really want to think of it as acting on, well, forget the blue stuff for a moment. We have the image of the quantum affine Schur functor, which assigns to this affine Heck algebra module here, its tensor product over the finite Heck algebra with this vector space. But now I also want to set all these very, all these x's to roots of unity. And I do it like I explained at the start more nicely by taking a quotient by this ideal. All these are symmetric functions. So they commute with the Hecke action. So this is a good thing to do. I can still take the tensor product over the finite Hecke algebra with this thing here. And this is just isomorphic to the vector space over here. But now it naturally comes with, well, this family of commuting operators obtained from the center via freezing. Here's the explicit formula for all the higher Hamiltonians in terms of spin McDonald's operators, linearized, and then some linear combination. And it comes with non-abelian symmetries. Namely, we have an L operator, which is the L operator where the inhomogeneities or the evaluation parameters are replaced by Y operators. At Q is one, and then modulo this ideal. This also acts on this big space here. And well, the center of course commutes with these Ys, so it will certainly commute with this L operator. So I have precisely the setting that I promised. Moreover, 
and I haven't really motivated this part, but at least by explaining that this Hamiltonian really is a kind of a spin McDonald's operator in disguise, it's no longer very surprising that its spectrum should involve um, McDonald's polynomials. So here's just the statement that I said at the start. Basically, the being determined by a particular component is a consequence of living in this uh, space here. So if people are interested, I prepared some explanations really of this last point, but it's a bit it would require another few minutes. So I want to omit it for now. And then if people are interested, I'm happy to comment on it afterwards. But at least hopefully now I made plausible that McDonald's polynomials should appear in spectrum. Note that this is not completely obvious because these are McDonald's polynomials just in M variables where M is related to the weight space that I was looking at. And they are McDonald's polynomials at this quantum spherical zonal point, which again is not obvious because what I did is I linearized at Q is one things. So in principle, it's not clear that I should get this particular uh, parameters Q and T rolling out. And really we do kind of a, a bit of work to, to derive this. Moreover, here's the Dreyfeld polynomial. Um, so here are the results that I presented at the start, but hopefully now everything really makes sense. And you see that this is really some sort of special limit of this spin generalization of McDonald theory, which is already quite interesting in itself. I would like to um, finish by putting, well, okay, so, so here's the summary. So we have this Hamiltonian, here's the picture. So we have the affine Heck algebra. This is the structure controlling everything. We can apply the quantum affine Schur functor to it. Um, well, really to representations of it. And we can either, well, in one special case, it gave rise to spin, uh, to ordinary McDonald's Reissner's theory, which has normal McDonald's operators and normal McDonald's polynomials as eigenfunctions. But I can also introduce these spins, as I've explained. And this setting naturally comes with these non-abelian symmetries. Moreover, you can take this particular limit, freezing, to get this spin chain. And it inherits all the properties at the top with this exact spectrum um, in featuring this special case of McDonald's polynomials. So one thing that actually I don't really know, so I can prove that this spectrum that I gave here, that these eigenfunctions here are the correct eigenfunctions. But our proof is, you know, it's like several pages. It's really quite intricate. It relies on lots of stuff. So I'm happy to summarize it at the end if there's interest. But I don't really understand why this special case of parameters should show up. So one thing that I would be very interested to understand is why did quantum zonal spherical um, polynomials show up in the spectrum? We know that these are very special. You know, they're related to harmonic analysis. So maybe harmonic analysis somehow allows us to uh, understand it, but I don't really kind of intrinsically understand why these McDonald's polynomials should show up. Um, so that's one puzzle that we have. There, there are several more. Another thing, maybe setting these variables to roots of unities, it sounds a bit like doing some, something with a cyclotomic Hecke algebra. So one, I also don't really know, but you could imagine that maybe algebraically this can be understood even more nicely by taking some sort of half cyclotomic Daha. And I just don't know, I've never, I'm not an expert on this but maybe it's, it's, it's insightful, maybe not. Yet another question is I've recently understood that this space that I've described, um, this kind of quotient, this kind of spaces that show up here, they naturally appear as um, the K theory um, for some partial flag varieties. And um, so there's a nice geometric setting. Normally you take the affine Heck algebra module where the, the Y operators just act by multiplication by variables and people understand in geometry what this means. But in this case, I take the Daha dual picture where the Y operators really act by theoretic difference operators. And I don't know if there's kind of what the geometric understanding of this would be or how it's, how either this can contribute to things in geometry or the other way around. So there are several puzzles really that are left behind. What I would like to finish with in the last uh, maybe two minutes, if that's all right, is kind of a picture that I have in mind. So it's sort of the, the this is only a part of a piece, a piece of a puzzle that I'm really interested in. So here's a landscape of these long range spin chains that I started with. So we've studied these models on the right. If you know about spin chains, then you will know these models on the left, the Heisenberg models, and there are different versions of them. But there actually, there exists some integrable um, or exactly solvable models that interpolate between it. So there's, at least for RS2, there is an Inozemtsev spin chain. It's as a pair potential, so it has this anti-symmetrization, one minus the permutation, but its potential is a Weierstrass P function, which has an extra imaginary period. In one limit of the imaginary periods, 
it's very degenerate and you only have nearest neighbor interactions. In the other limit, you kill the second period and you get a trigger metric one over sine squared function back. This function, this model is much more complicated, but we can also study its spec from using some sort of beta ansatz. So in this case, I believe that this can be better understood, but it's not quite done yet by some sort of freezing as I've described it. So I know that I think this, this will yeah, be settled in the, kind of soon. Um, but there are still many questions about this Inus MSEF model. And I think this freezing really has a good background from it. Moreover, there should also, in principle, you know, here we have Youngians, then you have quantum loop algebras. In principle, they're also elliptic quantum groups. For Heisenberg, this is known. There's a Heisenberg XYZ model, uh, which is completely anisotropic. So the spins kind of interact differently in all the directions. Um, but in principle, there should also be an elliptic version of this Haldane Shastri model. And it would be amazing if this can be studied. Maybe it's related to some, you know, it fits in this picture that I've sketched now. And then it's not even known what the T deformed Inozemsev model would be. But I actually think that once we understand properly where this bottom model comes from, from freezing, then we can also do a T deformed version. So, really, I think that all these models should really be understood from these, well, actually, the spin versions of quantum many body system. And we've now focused on this trigonometric Reisner's McDonald thing, but really there is also an elliptic McDonald's uh, Reisner's model. Its eigenfunctions are, I mean, it's much more complicated to understand its spectrum. You don't, we're not so lucky to have McDonald polynomials in that case, but you know, it's the, the, the Reisner's operators are very natural. You just replace those rational functions that we had in the McDonald polynomials by ratios of Jacobi theta functions. So it's a really natural thing to do. You can try to understand its spectrum. And I kind of, Conversely, I think that maybe these spin chains will help understanding these models because the spin chains are some sort of discretizations, finite dimensional versions of the thing. So really, I think this is a very nice picture uh, to leave you with. And I hope that there will be developments in all of these areas here and including on the McDonald's side, of course. Thank you very much for your attention. Let us thank Jules for a very nice talk. Any questions, comments? Yeah, so can I, so uh, maybe it's something that was confusing me earlier was maybe that your uh, D operators are uh, you really, I mean, you explained it later that these D operators you expand as differential operators, right? So, uh, so sorry, which ones? Um, these here. Yeah, I mean, I was asking you about how how do you see the, that these operators are, uh, correspond to a spin chain where the particles are moving? Uh, right. right. So, so basically, I want to reinterpret these, these x's as multiplicative coordinates. So the multiplicative coordinates on these unit circles. Right. And these x's here, they don't have any restriction. They can be any, any value on the unit circle. So they are just complex numbers of modulus 1. Right. But, uh, and, but there, you, since you had multiplication by Q, uh, I was confused as to whether... Uh, right, so the kinetic energy in some sense, mm -hmm. it, it does this multiplication by Q, but that doesn't mean that the particles can only move there. So somehow there's a difference. You know, if you think about the Hamiltonian as, I guess, the infinitesimal generator of um, time translation, then of course the full time evolution is the continuous, it's a one parameter family right. things, parameterized by the time and any kind of shift will occur there. So the Hamiltonian is just, it's, uh, you know, infinitesimal generator. Um, uh -huh. I don't know what would convince you. I mean, I don't know precisely so how to find the answer. Uh, expanded the D operator as uh, in... Uh, right, so here's, I guess, another way of seeing it. So you can think of this shift operator as some infinite sum of differential operators. It's just, so basically, at the Calogero level, you take these differential operators, but now we want something that is formally periodic. So I want something that is sort of, this is linear in derivatives. I want something that is periodic in derivatives. Mm -hmm. And so I do this infinite series, which you can either view as a formal thing or realize that it's just a Q difference operator. And mm -hmm. these spin McDonald operators, you know, since the derivative essentially appears as a power of Q. Mm -hmm. So basically what I'm saying is this is nothing but Q to the power X dx. So I have something where if I would multiply, if I would shift x dx by an appropriate constant, it's a period. Mm -hmm. So we made it sort of periodic ones. Mm -hmm. We change the way that the derivative acts, but the model, the particles are still allowed to move freely. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, thanks.
more questions? Okay, so if not, uh, let's thank Jules again for a very nice one. So we'll meet in uh, 50 minutes for the next talk. So thank you.